Welcome to Sarder TV, an idea sharing platform founded by Russell Sarder, who's an author, investor, and the CEO of Netcom Learning. We're thrilled to have Brian Wong join us today. Brian spent several years as an executive at the e-commerce giant called Alibaba, and he wrote a book called The Tao of Alibaba, which talks about the company's transformation from a tiny startup to a digital giant. Brian, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us Thank today. You. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, a little bit about your career. Sure. Well, I'm uh, born and raised in, in Palo Alto, California. Um, I had a pretty uneventful uh, childhood, but you know, very much thought about as, as I was growing up what sort of life I wanted to live. Like my father is a physician and that was a big influence on me uh, growing up. But you know, I always thought that um, I wanted to do something that would allow me to do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. And so I thought I would become a doctor like him, but go into something like health policy or you know, public health. That, that seemed to be very uh, exciting to me. But I ended up you know, spending time uh, both in the US but also in China because of my uh, cultural curiosity of, of kind of my ancestry. And um, that ended up derailing my professional plans in healthcare. And um, I ended up doing something related to tech, but in the emerging markets. So we're here to talk about your new book, yeah. The Tao of Alibaba. Tell us why you decided to write the book. Well, I spent almost 20 years at this company and it started out just as, well, that would be interesting to kind of see how technology mixes with emerging markets. You know, growing up in Silicon Valley, you saw how technology was changing the way that society kind of lived. And I said that that would be a really interesting experiment to go there and be a part of that. I thought it would be two years, turned it to 20 years. But the time that I was at the company uh, in, in China, I saw a lot of changes in developments that I thought were really important for, say, the Western markets to know about. And over that time, I never really had time to sit down and write about these things, except once I left the company, I said, hey, these stories are very valuable and important uh, because um, you know those of us in the US need to understand how um, the emerging markets, and particularly China, is changing. So I thought it would be very good to be able to write a book and distill a lot of the know-how and kind of understanding of the factors that led to this digital transformation that took place in China in the market that I was um, working. But also, you know, one of the companies that was a great catalyst behind that, how did it emerge and become what it is today? So tell us about Alibaba's origin story. So, as you know, Alibaba was founded by Jack Ma, and Jack Ma is, he was an English teacher, actually. So, he was born and raised in Hangzhou, China, never actually studied abroad, but he did have a very interesting um, life experience, uh, you know, when he was in, I think, high school or college. He ended up um, going to Australia to visit a pen pal. He spent his free time always uh, at the West Lake, which is a famous tourist attraction in Hangzhou. Uh, which is a city just outside of uh, Shanghai, about two, three hours. And that's how he learned his English. So he met this pen pal, um, was a man from Australia, and they stayed in touch. And he went to Australia, and that changed his whole view on, on the world, uh, seeing the world from a different perspective. And um, since that time, you know, he grew up speaking very good English, but you know, very curious about other perspectives, so to speak. And so I think that, um, you know, the language allowed him to understand kind of international trade and these things that were happening, but he also discovered the internet on a trip to the United States. And so the origin stories of Alibaba is really that it was the third, it's actually the third effort that Jack had in terms of entrepreneurship. He had a translation company. He started the first uh, Chinese internet company called China Yellow Pages or China Pages. And then Alibaba was his third attempt at that. You know, it's interesting that someone with his background, no technology background, someone, as we all know, who actually failed his college exam multiple times, um, ended up becoming one of China's most influential entrepreneurs um, in the tech space. Uh, but there, there's, a, there's a very you know, fascinating story behind that, and that's also what I cover in the book. Yeah, that is fascinating, amazing. And you were employee number 52. Yeah. So you were there really practically from the beginning. Yeah, we were in the apartment, yes. So w which apartment is that? Was that <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Jack started the company in his um, home, which was an apartment. Uh, they didn't have garages there. They, they started the companies in apartments. But 1999, um, it was very early days. 
8 million internet users in China at the time. The per capita income was $800. Uh, China constituted less than 1% of the world's e-commerce uh, transactions. Frankly speaking, you know, it was a, most people didn't think that China would develop at the rate that it did given the base that it was working from. And so, um, yeah, that was uh, sort of the, the situation at the time, yeah. Tell us what it was like working for him, for Jack Ma. So, you know, Jack being a teacher was very much, um, his approach was really to empower his team and, and encourage them. So rather than sort of a top-down command and control, it was really, you know, hey guys, here's what we want to achieve. And I, I think, you know, the internet has this great possibilities of, of changing the way that small businesses do, you know, trade and all these things. He had a vision and, and, and a mission for the company. But he said, now, um, you know, you guys, Brian, you understand the international markets. You know, these young people he hired in the tech space, in, that were the engineers, he said, you guys understand the technology. Help, help me build this. Let's build this together. Uh, so it was very much kind of setting the direction and then letting kind of the young people, many who was, were, whom were his uh, former English students, um, some were friends from like his teaching days. He's like, you guys understand how to do this, now let's do it together. So I think it, it was very much an enabling in a more of a nurturing environment that sort of a teacher might create for their, you know, for the team as opposed to this, you got to do this, you got to do that. So you were born, raised, educated in the U.S. You went to Wharton. You got where you got your MBA. Yeah. What were you most surprised by when you know working for a Chinese company? Yeah, you know it's it's interesting. Um, there are a lot of things that surprised me, and particularly um, one of the themes was sort of the, the non-traditional way that um, you know we went about doing business. Um, one of the things I realized is that China at that time, and, and even today, it only has like a few decades of business sort of history in, in terms of, you know, this post kind of um, planning, e planned economy sort of era, you know. Um, uh, probably at that time, it was about 30 years, um, it had been a market economy. So a lot of the things that the, the entrepreneurs are trying to do, they're trying to build from scratch. They don't have like this institutionalized kind of business principles that they apply because business didn't really exist in that free market form. As opposed to the United States, which is like over 150 years of kind of this business history. So a lot of the ways that we were making decisions um, were not the traditional MBA approach. And sometimes I'd try and remind them, well, this is how it should be done, this is how it should be done. But the fact of the matter is, even the, the business environment itself didn't have sort of the, the things you would assume that exist in the market, like a developed uh, sort of financial system. Even the retail uh, markets were very underdeveloped. Um, uh, and, and so a lot of the infrastructure didn't exist. And a lot of the mentality doesn't exist. And so when we were trying to lay out plans, I would use more of a traditional approach, kind of an MBA approach. And they would use more guerrilla tactics and you know, things that were kind of on the fly. And you know, let's also put it in perspective. Um, China was one of the fastest growing economies at that time, and it was also, the internet was one of the fastest growing um, industries at that time. And so if you had, you know, the fastest growing industry and the fastest growing market, you've got this rate of change also that is unprecedented, and you have to kind of act and decide on the fly, and um, a lot of cases there was no precedent. How is the business culture in China different than it is in the West? I think that there's a difference in terms of business culture in China versus U.S. and also Alibaba is also different within China. Mm -hmm. So I can speak more authoritatively about Alibaba. Um, Alibaba is very much in kind of, you know, business terms, you say a mission-driven dri organization that um, in a lot of ways, um, people that come to the company, they after working at the organization, um, they have a very clear idea of, 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 of this mission and this purpose. And um, I would say that that is a driving force, even though there might be times of uncertainty or them not quite knowing how to address the problems, they are committed and they're driven in a way that I've never seen many organizations um, because there's such a strong spirit of, of doing something um, for, you know, to fulfill that, that purpose or objective. And um, I think it's highly entrepreneurial. Like uh, one of the things about Alibaba was that 
there was a lot of room uh, allowed to kind of innovate from the bottom up as opposed to top down. And I think that um, that's where a lot of the creativity and the innovation came from. Jack allowed for that, uh, while at the same time setting that direction for the organization. Talk a little bit about how Alibaba or what their role was in helping shape China's digital journey. So, I mean, as you know, um, uh, you know, China in, in the 1999, early 2000s, uh, had a very rudimentary uh, retail system. They had basically a few state-owned uh, department stores and not a lot in the way of kind of, you know, retail sort of bricks and mortar. In fact, I think one of the latest statistics was like America has 30 times more shopping malls than China, even though their population is like one fourth, right? And not only that, they didn't have a, a developed financial system. Like there were very few people who own uh, use credit cards. M most of it was a cash-based sort of um, you know society, and so um, Alibaba really helped create that infrastructure. Uh, but it was all done virtually. Because there was a, a lack of this legacy system, people, they enabled um, you know, merchants and consumers and to all sort of go online or use uh, the digital solutions to address the gap in the existing kind of um, you know, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So that's how they actually were able to transform the economy from kind of a more traditional to a, a digital one to the point where today, uh, I think over 52% of all retail uh, transactions are actually done online through e-commerce versus the offline. And that's compared to, say, the United States, which is about 19%, and the UK, which is probably about 5 6%. So you can see over the last 20 years how Alibaba has been a major catalyst in changing behavior um, in, in, in a country that actually started with very little. Alibaba also didn't have a lot of the attributes of, you know, what a typical successful startup might have, yeah. yet they were able to help in this, you know, transfer this digital transformation yeah. in China. How do you think they were able to do that with being so atypical? So a big part of this was Jack's and the team's real um, focus on trying to understand the customers and their you know, the, the pain points, so to speak. Um, you know, a lot of people at that time were taking Silicon Valley models and copying them over to China, thinking like, uh, you know, it worked in, in Silicon Valley, so let's just, you know, apply it to the China market. But what Jack realized is that China was very different for the reasons I mentioned previously. But we would do crazy things like, you asked about, you know, the difference in terms of the, um, sort of traditional business training in, in, in China. It, we had an internet company, I remember Jack said, uh, Brian, help us build a product uh, for the suppliers to create their own websites. Um, and I said, okay, great, I'll do a DIY. Like, I'll, I'll have this um, online sort of interface and then they can go on and they can build their own websites because that'll be very scalable. Like, you don't have to, you know, help each one uh, individually. And um, that plan failed miserably because the, the business owners, the fact, like the factory owners at that time who were trying to export, they did not even understand what the internet was or how it was relevant to them. So what we ended up doing in the end was actually setting up these sales teams that would go door to door and literally sell like an internet website product and then we would manually build these sites for them. And to me that seems so rudimentary and so like backwards from an internet perspective, but what it was, it was required because essentially we were educating the China market uh, about what the value of the internet was and then teaching them in the process of selling um, how to actually manage this. We even had to train them on how to respond to emails politely because they didn't know the cultural dynamics, they didn't understand you know, how to, to communicate because most of these, these small business uh, factory owners, they would work with a trading company and the trading company would then manage the relationships with the international buyers. So there was this whole lack of understanding on how to interface with the world, which Alibaba actually ended up providing as part of our business. So that in a way is how things developed in the market and that's the effort that it took for uh, a company like Alibaba to actually make these changes. 
So you, the name of your book is The Tao of Alibaba. Yes. <laughs> Explain to us what Tao is. So Tao, as you know, comes from Taoism, you know, which is a philosophy and it's, it was at one point a religion, probably one of the oldest in China. But one of the complications of this philosophy is the first line of the first kind of most, uh, you know, classical text that Tao Te Ching says um, that the Tao is that which cannot be described. And so how do you go about trying to write a book about something that can't be described? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that is the, the mystique about this whole philosophy. And I break it down in, as best I can, because I'm not a ph philosophy expert, but in three um, sort of terms. Um, number one, it's the path or the way. So when we talk about the Tao of this or the Tao of that, it's basically that thing just becoming, right, in a natural sort of state according to the laws of the universe. And so like whether it's a tree, whether it's a person, whether it's a company, it all has a path that, it f that follows based on the laws of nature. The second is uh, harmony, the importance of harmony. And the harmony is really how you develop in sync with the, the universe around you. Um, and then the third aspect is this concept of embracing contradictions or what, what someone called the dialectic. And finding that balance, oftentimes uh, with Taoism, there's this concept of yin and yang. And it's, you know, they're opposites, whether it's, uh, you know, hot or cold, big and small, hard and soft, whatever, there's always a polarity. And that embracing of contradictions is also an important element when thinking about the Tao. And so I apply that all to um, Alibaba as a company. The path being, what is the path that we aspire to set for ourselves? And, you know, Alibaba's mission is to make it easy to do business anywhere. So that's really like our reason for existing is to help businesses, big and small, um, you know, become successful or become businesses, right? So that's our path. And when you talk about harmony, it's really looking at both the, um, the domestic market dynamics, but also the international market dynamics of how that will influence or impact the development of this company. And if you think about Alibaba's birth, it happened just before the WTO accession of China, which connected China to the world. And that was a huge factor in uh, uh, us being able to build our cross-border business. And then there were other factors like the, the shift from uh, export-driven economy to domestic consumption within the, the Chinese economy. And that's what helped Taobao become so successful. And many other different factors. But there was also the international factors as well, uh, as we talked globalization and whatnot. So that's kind of this whole harmony aspect. And then if you get into the um, embracing contradictions, you think about Alibaba, the largest e-commerce ecosystem in the world, built by chasing the small, trying to build a business to serve the small businesses. Um, if you think about Alibaba as a company, it's one that embraces Eastern sort of uh, philosophy of this intuition or sort of the fluidness, but it also embraces the Western um, business philosophy of systems and processes, and they're combining them together. So anyhow, we can kind of get more into all those sort of sort of dialectics, so to speak, but that those are the three aspects of Tao that I think apply to uh, Alibaba and what I describe in the book. So then how can these components be put together as a usable framework for business leaders and entrepreneurs? Well, I think the, the most broad example I can give you is Alibaba in the, the Tao of Alibaba is, is really the story about how um, a company, Jack created a company that was fluid and, and constantly recreating itself while at the same time focused and committed to a very clear purpose, right? So this idea that Alibaba has been able to survive for 20 years and, and continue to grow and develop, it really, uh, is, is because of this, this fluidity that's, that's the result of this Taoist thinking. But at the same time, it has a, a very clear path uh, that it's trying to follow. And within that, you can say there are systems and structures that at least give uh, the team the ability to work together and to kind of monitor how this more intuitive or more abstract sort of philosophy is implemented. So in the book, I also get into the factors of the Tao if you, if you want to get kind of more into the, the business school type of, of jargon. At the very top, so I have this diagram. At the very top, the company's path is defined by its mission, vision, and values. That's kind of the North Star 
for the organization. And then you, below that you have strategy, which is really the how to implement the, you know, this mission, vision, and values. And that's a very clear sort of stra strategic statement that I, I teach in the book, kind of how to um, define that through a process, which takes into account both the internal capabilities of the company, but also the external factors. Um, which is kind of that harmony, so to speak, right? And then below that, below the strategy is the implementation aspects. It's organization, people, uh, and performance management. And so that is my attempt to use more concrete sort of business terms to explain how to implement this DAO, uh, whether it's in Alibaba or any company. And uh, ultimately the goal is to create the same kind of organization that Alibaba uh, is, um, which is a mission-driven organization that has also, uh, that empowers its team to kind of be able to innovate uh, kind of autonomously, but towards a common goal. So tell us about some of the business challenges that Alibaba faced and how they used unorthodox approaches to not only survive, but thrive. Well, you know, some of these cases, so there definitely have been crises um, and um, some of these crises actually, funny enough, also sort of never really became crises because Jack often said that when, you know, when the, the sun is shining, that's the time to repair your roof. You shouldn't wait till the storm hits and then realize you have this leaky roof and you have to fix it because it's too late by then. So I think um, I'll describe first uh, some crises and what we did and then second is um, some cases where I think we actually prevented the crises. Um, probably the, the biggest crisis that I think was, was quite pivotal in Alibaba's history was around 2010 when we actually discovered um, some uh, fraudulent accounts that were being signed up by our sales teams in, in, in uh, the south part of China. I think the sales teams generally, there's always pressure to perform, right? But sometimes they'll cut corners. And in this case, they were signing up accounts that um, were basically uh, these customers who were using the accounts as a front in order to cheat um, buyers. And there were probably like a thousand of these accounts um, and there were probably a hundred salespeople in this province in Fujian, which is in the south, that were signing up these clients. We discovered that through investigation and um, you know the numbers, although you know a thousand accounts is, sounds like a lot, it was actually according to like uh, disclosure uh, rules and whatnot as a publicly listed company it was not material enough to, for us to really declare. But um, nonetheless, when we discovered it, it became a very big issue. And the reason it became a big issue is because it reflected the, the um, what I would say, the deterioration of company values within the organization. And the values being like integrity is one of the top values. If you don't have integrity within a marketplace, then you basically have no business. And Jack was very, very adamant about the about living in, in, in you know, sort of demonstrating our company values through our behavior. You can't say something and do something else. And so not only did we kind of make this public within the company, we made a public announcement, like, you know, to the market that this issue had been discovered. But not only that, the CEO and the COO at that time actually resigned. Can you imagine like those two positions leaving a company for the purposes of um, taking responsibility for a breach of a, of a sort of immaterial type of um, you know, incident? Well, Jack uh, felt that was the right thing to do because it sent a message that we really take these values seriously and that there needs to be you know, responsibility in this. And I think that also sent a message to um, you know, the whole community and the ecosystem that you know, Alibaba really does believe in what it says. So that was a pretty major crisis. Um, there have been other crises like when some of our um, merchants protested at the company because we actually were raising the prices of um, the fees for what we call the Tmall. It's like the Amazon, like the B2C business um, users. Um, and this was at a time when there was a lot of counterfeit stuff happening and we wanted to create uh, a difference in terms of the Taobao market and the Tmall market. Taobao is more kind of a C2C, kind of like a flea market kind of, right? And then uh, B2C is much more of a shopping mall, brands representing themselves. 
And a lot of the merchants were upset. There were thousands of merchants protesting physically outside the office. And then they also staged a protest where they were um, actually uh, purchasing products and then canceling um, on, on the marketplace to try and create chaos. And you know, Jack uh, and the team, they didn't back down. This was, again, another principle where they felt it was very important. It wasn't to like make more money off the customers. It was, it was really to create a difference in terms of the quality and to weed out those who are not serious. And it was a very stressful time because you can see like an uprising of you know, your users trying to, um, you know, and many of those users though, that were protesting were probably not ones that were, uh, you know, willing to make that commitment to um, play in that space that is a much more sort of high quality sort of, you know, retail kind of uh, experience for, for their customers. And so I think what this boils down to often is just principles and, and how, what a company believes and what the leader believes and then how you actually kind of stay, um, you know, true to those, those beliefs, yeah. Yeah, like the North Star, right? Yeah. Your yeah. values and your principles always yeah. become your North Stars and guide and everything do, you and do. And doing it for the right reasons, right? So like one of our values is customer first, employee second, shareholder third. And, um, uh, you know, really why are we making these decisions the way we are? I mean, I'll give a counter example to this uh, protest um, situation with Tmall, which was during the 2008 financial crisis. Um, a lot of businesses were... Uh, in pain because while the Chinese economy at 2008 was relatively protected, the international markets were taking a tailspin, right? So a lot of the demand for manufactured products from China really uh, dropped dr dramatically. So what Alibaba ended up doing was actually slashing the prices of their services to the Chinese um, uh, customers by like 40% because they wanted, to, in knowing that there was a risk that they might actually, you know, that's going to affect our bottom line. It's going to affect our profitability. But the, the principle behind that was, is you need to help your, your customers survive the winter so that then, you know, when things turn around, everyone will still be able to kind of recover together. And I think that's, that's a pretty big decision on the part of the company, and it's a big risk. But it also strengthened the loyalty between Alibaba and its um, you know, merchant base. And within a year, actually things not only recovered, but they actually came back even, even stronger. And um, I think that is a testament to kind of the, the commitment that this company had towards its customers. So Jack Ma also liked to do things unconventionally, um, including things like you know, bringing on newcomers or rookies yeah. to take on like big initiatives, um, why, why did he take that approach? And did you see it succeed, fail? Jack himself is kind of em emblematic or representative of this non-traditional approach, himself being an English teacher, competing in a, in a world that is run by, you know, PhDs and, you know, techies. Uh, um, and uh, so I think he felt like, well, if Jack can do this and operate in this way, like, why not think about also appointing leaders for other businesses that have a fresh perspective? So, I mean, there are a few examples. When you talk about rookies, really what that represents is people who are not from that industry. They might be kind of new to that space. And two really good examples of that were um, our Alipay uh, business. Alipay is now the largest like, you know, payment system in China and really revolutionized the way that people uh, do, uh, engage in financial services. So when they set out to start that business and they needed the business uh, you know, very urgently because there was no really good payment system to facilitate e-commerce in China at the time, this is 2004. So he went to a, 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 a guy from our team, his name was Jonathan, and Jonathan was like our sales head in Shenzhen, which is in the south. He's doing a great job, but Jonathan's background was a hotel manager. So, so here's how the conversation went. Jack said, Jonathan, what do you know about the financial industry? And Jonathan said, nothing. Like, I've never worked in that space. And then he said, okay, great. Jonathan, what do you know about PayPal, this company? He's like, I don't know, never heard of it. And then Jack said, excellent, you're hired. You're going to be the founder and CEO of Alipay. 
And most people would be thinking that's absurd. Like you definitely want to get someone who either has a banking background or at least you know is familiar with PayPal or the, 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 the payment, the internet payment systems that are coming out. But Jack wanted someone who had a fresh perspective on the space, but it was also customer centric. And Jonathan turned out to be very, very successful um, Alipay CEO and the company has moved on to become what it is today. Um, Jack made the same sort of decision for our logistics um, data network called uh, Tainiao. He, he approached um, a woman named Judy Tong who actually started out as, the, as a company secretary and then moved her way up in terms of the, doing a, the managing the administration part of the business. But she never worked in logistics. And he, he said, you know, well, Judy, it would be, make a great CEO for Tainiao because she understands how companies work and what their, you know, kind of operational needs are. And, um, you know, she is probably going to be very, you know, conscientious or just very aware of how to kind of link up uh, these kinds of services through a, a system. And, um, you know, Tai Now is, is revolutionary in terms of how it coordinates logistics companies and their services. So those are two examples where it worked. There have been failures, yes, but I think when it comes to the really successful parts of the company and also what I think are fundamental, there's four pillars in the digital economy that I think drive this ecosystem, commerce, payments, logistics, and big data. Um, two of those, um, well, you can say three of those four were started by non-industry insiders. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. So he made the right picks. So he had a knack for kind of Absolutely. Seeing what, you know, skill sets people might have, even if they might not be in those positions. I think that was one of Jack's greatest skills is understanding people and their, their strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Um, and if I could go back to the, the, the Taoist concept of, you know, this kind of embracing the contradictions, I would say Jack's greatest weakness was his greatest strength. And what I mean by that is, you know, Jack didn't have the technical background. He didn't have like the hardcore finance background. He didn't even go to business school. But what he did understand were people and relationships and how to connect and how to nurture. And that is how he brought together a team of very skilled, but also very passionate people, um, you know, that, that, that came for the same purpose uh, and, and objectives that he set for the company. And he brought them together and allowed them to, to thrive. And I think that uh, that's the amazing story about Alibaba is, is how this one individual was able to create this phenomenon. And performance management was also yeah. handled a little differently at yeah. Alibaba. Tell us a little bit about how that worked. So I think that um, you're probably referring to this model um, that we had early on of what bulls, dogs, yes. and uh, rabbits. rabbits. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was a real dearth of, of talent in the early days in China in terms of hiring for internet companies because there were no real internet companies that you could hire from and even IT and internet knowledge was scarce. So we often said, well, what, what's more important, skills or cultural fit? And um, we really came out with this. Obviously, the best would be you, you're a good cultural fit and you have good skills or high performance, right? So we, we came up with this kind of uh, four quadrant matrix. You have abilities on the y-axis and then cultural fit on the x-axis. So if you were like a good cultural fit and a good and highly skilled or high performance, you're kind of up here in this quadrant, which is like, we call them the stars, or at least this area we call them, it's the bull ring. And that, that's where you wanna be. But if you are like a good cultural fit but not a good performer, you are a rabbit, okay? But rabbits could be trained to improve their skills, hopefully move up. If you had a poor cultural fit and you were a poor performer, you were here, you were like a dog, okay? Just the dogs, like you just kind of get rid of them. And then if you were a high performer but not a good cultural fit, what were you? You called a wild dog, meaning like, you are doing great on your sales, uh, whatever targets, or you're like really creating amazing products, but you are not representing the values of the company. And people always ask, well, what do we do with these people? And um, Savio, our first COO, said those people are the most dangerous because they are su succeeding in terms of performance, but they're creating the wrong company culture. 
And in the long run, company culture is, is the most important uh, for the company's success because you're trying to model good behavior, not just get the short-term results. So these wild dogs, he said, you gotta take them in the back and, and shoot them. You gotta get rid of them. Uh, and that was a very difficult thing for us to accept because as a manager, you want to meet your targets. And this is a high performer. They're helping you meet your targets. But they're also very dangerous to the company. And I think that because of that theory that, that Savio created early on, it actually helped to establish the right kind of company culture without risking um, kind of a deviation from what we wanted to become. And I also think it built a culture that was very cohesive, very um, you know, much operating in, as one. And when we had to make decisions in terms of, okay, you, you have a higher, when you're interviewing them, skill versus culture, they would always opt for a better cultural fit, even if their skills aren't quite there, because they can be trained up. And I think that served the company well, because I think the company's strength in its culture is what allowed it to get through these very difficult times. Mm -hmm. You also talk about Tai Chi management principles, yeah. right? Tell us about those and how those work. So Tai Chi uh, is really the, what I call like the physical manifestation of the Taoist philosophy. So it's both like a meditative practice, but also a physical exercise. I could link this Tai Chi management principles back to your question on what is the Tao. Uh, and I think that what Jack always talked about is, is kind of, you know, uh, how it's important to practice like the physical exercise of Tai Chi because in a way you're almost internalizing these motions but it's it's a it's a meditative process it's both hard and soft you know internal external but also I think that allows you the time to reflect and kind of think about kind of you know your relationship with the, your surroundings and Tai Chi often is this practice of not hitting something straight on like you know in terms of a force, it's actually taking the force that comes at you and using it and redirecting it in a way that's going to be productive. So I think all of those elements in Tai Chi, also this yin-yang balance, um, are representative of the way of thinking of the company. I, I can give you an example, like when eBay came into uh, China in 2003, if you tried to go head-to-head, -head, and, and Alibaba was very small at the time, didn't even have a, a consumer retail business. It just decided to launch um, when, you know, once they heard eBay was coming. eBay was this monster, right? Alibaba very much used kind of eBay's size and strength as, as a way to kind of, you know, lure them in, but then kind of also use that strength to kind of give itself, to drive it, it, its own business. Um, like a differentiator almost? Was it able to differentiate? Differentiator, and just the very fact that eBay came in brought awareness to this, you know, consumer e-commerce. Mm. And then sort of Taobao sort of piggybacked off that, but then also, like you said, differentiated or kind of just associating with them in the fight brought attention to Taobao, like, oh, who is this little upstart trying to take on the you know, the David and Goliath battle. But then they also, we also use guerrilla marketing tactics, like things, I remember in um, California when eBay Live had, you know, there was their big celebration in San Jose. And we actually tried to get a booth in eBay Live to kind of promote Alibaba and, and, and whatnot, but they wouldn't allow us. So what we did is we um, set up these, uh, these two uh, sort of, not booths, but we, pre we we rented out two hotel suites at each end of the conference center, and we started handing out our, uh, on the street, we handed out these these orange bags, which people would take and then go into the eBay Live conference. But there were so many of these orange bags people were carrying around that had Alibaba on it. People were wondering who is Alibaba, uh, even though it was this massive eBay Live event. And I think those, those types of kind of scrappy, um, tactics also play into the strength of, of this big juggernaut, but also brings awareness to you know, us as a competitor. You mentioned Taobao a couple of times too. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that and how they came to be and how Alibaba played a part in that. Well, so Taobao was really um, the retail e-commerce um, you know, arm of, of Alibaba Group. And it was started initially because of the 
fear that you know eBay, if they came into the China market, they would really not only take the consumer marketplace, but they might actually move into other areas that were competitive with, with Alibaba Group. More importantly was the realization that um, the Chinese consumers did not have access to products um, that the rest of the world did because they had such a rudimentary retail, um, like I talked about earlier, infrastructure system. So I think a big driver too, beyond just the competitive aspects, was that consumers in China had curiosity and a desire to access products from all over the world, but they weren't able to do that through the traditional means. So how do we actually give them access to that through the internet? And one of the things that people always talk about at eBay is that they had 95% market share at the time that um, Taobao got started. That's true if you look at the uh, addressable market that was already online and already purchasing products. But if you look at the addressable market, which was 90, so, so that's probably like three to four million, I guess, at that time. But if you look at the addressable market that was already online in say 2003, 2004, it was like 90 million, okay? And you could say, well, that's the market that we're trying to address and, and provide them access to these products. But if you, if you take a step back further and say, no, actually the addressable market is not just those who are online, but actually the entire sort of retail market, that's, that was at the time like seven, 800 million. And so what Taobao really thought about is how do we serve this seven, 800 million people that want access to all these products but don't know how to find it? That's what we're creating for them. And that marketing approach was dramatically different from what you would do if you were like just competing with eBay. We actually used the same process we did with B2B, educate the market through very traditional means. Like we'd have seminars, we'd do a lot of offline stuff to kind of educate the, um, the normal Chinese consumer that Taobao was the place to find anything from anywhere. Uh, and you can do that all through your internet. You know? so, so in a way we drove the adoption and the use of the internet for um, you know, retail consumption. How is it doing today? Oh, so today it's like over um, a billion um, you know, users and uh, over a trillion dollars in gross merchandise value. Uh, so it's by far the largest in the world. And that, again, is the result of kind of this evolution of this ecosystem that um, you know, uh, Alibaba Group really helped to catalyze. So the other thing that you talk about is why leaders need to know about LQ okay. or the love quotient, <laughs> <laughs> which is just as important as IQ so EQ. and EQ, yeah. right? Tell us more. Well, again, this is a, this is a Jack Ma creation, but he used to say um, that if you want to be successful, you need a high IQ and a high EQ. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be respected, you need LQ, love quotient. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is that uh, I think that one can do business and you know, kind of get these results, but if you don't have a reason or a purpose for doing it, and you're not trying to contribute or um, you know, help others, then in some ways it doesn't really have as much meaning. And I think that for him, he's always done things for a purpose and he's someone with a lot of compassion, a lot of empathy. And I think that human trait is what made the company so unique and also what made Jack such a charismatic leader. I think the best example is if you look back in 2017 in a conversation between Jack and Elon Musk that took place in Shanghai. I don't know if you've seen this. But Elon Musk spent, I mean, it was, the conversation was two ships passing in, 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 in the night. You know, it's like, Elon is talking about the importance of technology, the threat of AI, how he wants to use technology to, you know, send people to Mars. And Jack is talking about how technology should be used to serve humans and how, you know, computers have microchips, but, you know, they don't have a heart and that um, they will never be able to replace humans because of that. Uh, and, you know, Jack says, rather than us spending all this time and resource on outer space, we should be looking at inner space, which is how do we save our world from, you know, destruction, not try and figure out how to get off the Earth. I think both sides are right. But for Jack, obviously the LQ is critical because that's what drives all this. And he thinks that technology is just a tool for serving 
us as human beings, but we should use it in a way to, to build uh, you know, a better society and um, improve our lives. So what kind of lessons then can um, be gleaned for entrepreneurs and you know, um, new business owners on how to use some of these principles for the greater good? Sure. I think first and foremost is how do you gear your company in a way that is focused on a greater purpose than just you know, existing or just making money. Uh, some businesses, that's the pure objective and that's fine. But are they going to be as impactful in terms of society? Probably not because the kind of people you attract, the kind of goals you set for yourself are not going to be encompassing of the larger society. So this whole idea of a, a mission and a vision is very important from the onset for entrepreneurs. But it should also have an element, what I talk about in the book is this uh, element of altruism. If you look at what Alibaba's mission and vision is today, it says very little about how it wants to be number one in this industry or the biggest in this industry. It says how it wants to create 100 million jobs, serve 2 billion consumers, and help 10 million SMEs become profitable. And people would hear that and they might say, you know, that's, that sounds great, that sounds like a CSR objective. But actually, this is what's been driving the company and it's allowed us to achieve what we have. I mean, if you look at Alibaba's impact on China, China's society, um, it's not insignificant in terms of job creation, in terms of bringing in marginalized or underserved communities into the mainstream economy. 46% of Taobao's store owners are women. There's like a, over 160,000 um, physically disabled people that run shops on Taobao. Uh, but m probably most significantly is it's brought the rural community into the uh, mainstream economy by enabling them not just to access products that they never could before in remote areas, but also sell their products to urban areas. And that has reversed in many of the, the cases that we've studied, the flow of the village rural populations into the cities. In fact, they can stay within their villages and produce enough income for themselves, but also create jobs that actually attract people back. And I think that what we're looking at today in terms of society, a lot of this internal strife, whether it's the United States or China or anywhere, is because of economic disparity or inequality uh, in terms of accessing opportunities. And so for entrepreneurs, I think, to get back to your question, having that mindset when you start a company can actually help you create something of great significance. Alibaba started out as a small business and then it became what it is today. Uh, but it was because of that unrelenting focus on trying to create something of, of purpose and significance beyond ourselves. So that's the first thing I would take away. Second, I would say is, well, gets to what I just said, is, is recognize the value of entrepreneurship as a force of change in society and realize that you as an entrepreneur are playing a role in that. And that will be a great motivator for you to uh, continue the fight even when things are tough. Because we know entrepreneurs have very tough lives. They suffer a lot in silence because no one else understands their challenges and they can't talk to their staff about it because they're working for them. They have to maintain a certain you know, image uh, amongst their team. But at the same time, they're trying to take on all these problems on their own. And um, you know, having a, uh, this recognizing what you can do as an entrepreneur with your company for a larger purpose or society is a good is a very important motivating factor to continue to fight the fight. And now what about um, leaders of large organizations already established? What can they what are some of the key lessons or the key takeaways from this book? Well, I think a big temptation these days is for leaders obviously to manage on the short term on a quarterly basis because a lot of uh, you know their their boards are giving them that sort of pressure, and I understand like that's a it's a practicality, but I think it would it would be um, important for them to also balance that with kind of the bigger picture, and then seeing yet another example of a great company that was sort of driven by sort of these more what I would call um, softer aspects of, of business but but nevertheless equally important 
And I hope that Alibaba can serve as an example to them to say, hey, look, actually this more holistic approach to running my large business is also very important. And you know, Alibaba's not alone. One of the things that Jack said in you know, our values today, customer first, employee second, shareholder third, was ahead of its time. He's been saying this since the early 2000s and people laughed at him, you know, particularly the Milton Friedman, you know, shareholder, uh, maximize shareholder value as the driver of business. And that's what I learned in business school. But, you know, isn't it interesting now that in 2019, you, you, the United States uh, Business Roundtable Organization led by the top 180 corporations, uh, I think Jamie Dimon at the time was the CEO, they revised their um, sort of manifesto and they said that it's no longer just about shareholder supremacy. There are multi-stakeholders we need to focus on. Customers, partners, suppliers, um, shareholders, and the larger society. And I think ESGs is an attempt to try and address that. There's a many different theories that are coming out, but it's become much more accepted. And it's because we as organizations, particularly large corporations, have a responsibility beyond just our, you know, profits. Um, and I think that this book is a, another great example of how that comes into play, but you can have both a successful business and um, a positive impact on society all in one. So then what would you say are some of the most important lessons that you have outlined in the book for um, entrepreneurs who are starting businesses that are still in the early stage? Yeah, I mean, I think I sort of addressed that in the, the previous question, um, the importance of having a, a greater purpose in your own business. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just figuring out how to then take that though and map it to specific sort of uh, projects in, in you know, your, your implementation. Like, it's one thing to have all of these great aspirations, but it's another thing to actually then make that into something uh, real. And uh, I think that that's where you have to link it to strategy and then the whole um, organization people and performance management, which I go into in the book. I think that those are gonna be very valuable to the entrepreneurs themselves. And uh, I think just finding the right people that uh, can uphold the, the values you believe in for your organization, yeah. Well, fascinating. This was really interesting. Thank you so much, Brian, yeah, for joining yeah. us today. Sure, my pleasure. And good luck with the book. Thank you, thank you. And we'll see you next time on Sardra TV.